to give you a little background of the Health Forward Hub, this organization was um, established to serve as a connective mechanism uh, who puts a great emphasis on inclusivity and inclusion for BIM communities. And uh, we have participated and led many discussions in terms of how best to minimize and bridge the gap between BIM communities and mainstream services. And ultimately, I would say our strength lies at being at the forefront of transformational change and bettering access for BIM communities in general. And um, with that said, um, today's aim is to facilitate an interactive session with our prominent and amazing um, leaders who kindly joined us to discuss leadership and the importance of leadership and what leadership looks like. And um, without further delay, I would like to also welcome our um, collaborators on this, uh, who are the Somali academics, who have been a great help in putting this together. So I would leave the floor to them. Uh, all right, I'm just going to share my screen with, other, with everyone. Um, one sec. <clears throat> okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank both Ibtisam and Dr. Aisha for allowing us to collaborate with you guys. Uh, I speak on behalf of Somali academics to say that we are extremely grateful uh, to have this opportunity. Now, uh, I'm Faisal, I'm one of the co-founders of Somali Academics alongside Ibrahim. Uh, and I sort of want to spend the next few minutes or so just to very quickly go over our organization and sort of discuss the reason why we thought uh, it was good for us to start this organization. Now, um, I would sort of like to direct you guys to a report that was published last year uh, by the leading roots titled The Broken Pipeline. Now, this report uh, aimed to look at some of the inequalities and biases that were found within higher education. Uh, in particular, they wanted to look at the portion of um, PhD studentships uh, that were funded uh, and awarded to black students over the last three years. Uh, and what they found was that out of the 20,000 PhD studentships that were awarded by the UKRI, which is one of the main uh, PhD uh, funding bodies in the UK, only a mere 1.2% were awarded to black or black mixed students. Now, clearly this is an underrepresentation and more needs to be done to address this issue. Uh, and within the same report, they sort of uh, highlighted ways in which we can address this underrepresentation. Now, although this was tailored towards the main funding agencies, so the UKRI and others, there were one or two points that they addressed, which we as PhD students ourselves can sort of uh, tackle to address this underrepresentation. One of the main ones that stood out for me was that a lot of students um, were often dissuaded from applying for uh, PhD programs because there, wasn't a, there was a lack of information available to them. Uh, and this sort of resonated well with myself and Ibrahim in the sense that uh, when we attended a careers fair uh, sort of tailored towards Somali students last year, around the same time the report was published, uh, we noticed that a lot of students um, expressed an interest in doing a PhD program only after speaking to us uh, about what we do as PhD students. Uh, and so we then decided to sort of expand our reach and organize a PhD Insight Day with the aim of sort of disseminating all the like, pertinent information available for uh, PhD, prospective PhD students to sort of encourage them to apply for the program. Uh, and we also sort of discussed issues related to doing a PhD and what a PhD actually entails. Um, and following on from that, we received a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and based on that, we then decided to sort of formally set up Somali Academics as an organization uh, to sort of address this need to uh, tackle the underrepresentation in academia. Um, and we set up the organization with the mission of uh, elevating the pursuit of higher education within our community and also to create a community of like-minded professional, uh, professionals all with a common goal of empowering our youth. Uh, and the way we sort of um, aim to go about doing that is by uh, creating a platform to showcase the success of Somali students and professionals uh, and academics, uh, such as today's event. Uh, we also aim to organize seminars and workshops in the near future that are tailored towards students at various stages of their academic career. And in, in, in the next few years or so, we hope to sort of entail the whole academic cycle going from uh, undergraduate students to postgraduate students and even postdocs and early career researchers. And another aim of ours, uh, is to build up a network of PhD students and candidates uh, that uh, undergraduate students can sort of tap into if they want to apply for a specific PhD program, uh, but also to sort of 
in the future, hopefully establish collaborations among Somali academics. Uh, and then the last aim is to encourage the, the next generation of Somali students to consider pursuing a PhD program, uh, again, in order to combat the, uh, the lack of representation we see amongst uh, academics and PhD holders. Uh, now, I did put up an asterisk next to the aims because uh, we, given that we started only a few months ago, we do on building on, on these aims and incorporating more. Now, before I pass on the mic to Dr. Aisha, I just wanna very briefly go over some housekeeping rules. Now, as you can see, this webinar is recorded. Um, so please keep that in mind. Uh, and we do intend on having a Q&A session at the end of each talk. Uh, but in order to submit your questions, we have a Q&A box uh, in the Zoom app, or, or you can alternatively uh, use our Twitter handles. Uh, so Somali Academics or uh, Phil Forward Hub uh, alongside the Beyond Academia hashtag and ask your questions via Twitter. Um, we do intend on sending out a survey towards the end of this session uh, where we ask for your feedback in, in the hopes of improving our events in the near future. And then lastly, slides will be available um, to be disseminated across, uh, across you guys, uh, but it's at the discretion of the speaker. So if you do want to uh, get hold of these slides, please do contact us. Uh, with all of that being said, I then would like to pass on to uh, the mic to Dr. Aisha Hassan, who will then introduce the event. Thank you, guys. Hi, thank you very much, Faisal and Iftisam. Um, firstly, salam alaikum. I would like to thank each and every single one of you who has made the effort today to join and benefit from this webinar, which we have specifically put together to ensure that you all have access to a plethora of leaders um, from all like in different sectors of life. Um, I'd also like to thank our amazing collaborators, the Somali Academics, and of course, to all of our esteemed guests who will be speaking today, but also running workshops. Now, in the spirit of keeping to time, I'd like to briefly tell you why it is that we are so passionate about bridging this gap between the youth and our established leaders. Well, firstly, I'd like to start off by saying that unpleasant truths must be spoken to power. I mean, on the one hand, the evidence is simply compelling. There are persistent inequalities to access, experience and successes predominantly for black students in higher education. And this is across multiple levels of studies. These disparities are persistent and they continue year after year. Nevertheless, on the other hand, it's no secret that today's society offers unprecedented advantages, um, uh, new ideals, ambitions to our youth. And to date, sustainable development goals have actually made it a priority to harness the potential of our youth, which quite frankly speaking, wasn't the norm two decades ago. Now, with a projected 1.3 billion people aged 15 to 24 by 2030, there is an accompanying message, an underlying message that young people must be prepared and they have to be ready to be the ones leading innovation and progress. So where do we then come in? Well, my mission is to ensure that a significant percentage of these future young leaders are black. My mission is to ensure that access and opportunities to black students is normalized. My mission is to ensure that the playing field is even because it will enable our youth to dream boldly. It will enable them to pursue goals with confidence and being able to speak with a voice that doesn't falter. I want to create future leaders from our countries, from our communities, because change comes through empowerment. And by collectively using our relational power, our knowledge, our resources that we have, we can inspire a whole generation of future leaders. Now, on that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Agbakova. She is a black female and established academic. She's also the first place World Congress Award winner in the field of health and biomedical informatics, a PhD holder in digital health innovations, and I could go on. Please welcome my dear friend, Dr. Ruth. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, perfect. Um, so it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, and I would like to thank um, Somali Academics and the Fell Forward Hub for reaching out to me. Um, I strongly feel that it's important for young people to have access to leaders and public figures. And um, it's important for young people to feel valued um, and to know that they are important. So we need to invest in our youth. And so I look forward to the discussions and activities of the day. Um, do you have a, uh, can you see my um, slides available at the moment? Let's just see. Let's see if I can share my screen. 
Um, oh, I think Somali academics, um, are you, do you have the slides there? We're just sorting out the slides, Ruth. Just give us a okay. second. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And just whilst um, they are sorting out the slides, um, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, as indicated by my, my um, Twitter handle, which is at Ruth Agbakova, or on LinkedIn, which is at Ruth um, Ngozi Agbakova. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, just give us a second. No problem at all. Can she not share a screen? Oh my God. Hi, Ruth. Um, do you happen to have the slides on your screen by any chance? Because for some reason, we can't seem to find it in our mailbox that you've sent it. So, what I can do is I can make you a co host and then you can share your screen. And if you have the slice up, is that okay with you? Uh, yeah. Perfect, yes, perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll do that now then. Okay, so you're a co-host now. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to share your screen. Perfect. So can you see my slides at the moment? Um, could it, is that the Leadership Beyond Academia, the first slide? Perfect, okay. So let me just double check. Okay, so uh, perfect. Um, so, uh, as I said, I'm delighted to be here and a part of um, the Somali Academics and the Fell Forward Hub uh, initiative. Um, I myself am from a Nigerian background and I strongly believe in uh, relational networks working together. And that's why I'm so um, passionate about the work that Somali Academics and the Fell Forward Hub are doing. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a digital health consultant uh, with the experience of working in the UK uh, National Health Service and the private sector. Um, I'm also an academic in the field of digital health innovation and sustainable transformation, uh, which is an arm of implementation science and informatics. Um, I have, uh, I think I feel very honored to have a rich background um, from working on the UK's largest innovation uh, program in healthcare to date and on Scotland's first national digital health and wellbeing service at scale. And I'm very passionate about equality, uh, diversity and inclusion in STEM, uh, which are uh, science, technology and mathematics, uh, engineering and mathematics. And I shall talk shortly about my advocacy work um, that I'm involved in. Okay. So just to give you a little bit about um, what we'll cover in this presentation today, um, I'll give an insight into uh, my leadership journey to date. Um, I'll talk about uh, some of the challenges I have faced in my field and also share an insight into how I was able to circumnavigate and overcome challenges using my unique uh, differences uh, to my advantage. And finally, I shall also discuss how I'm paying it forward in my role with some of the advocacy work that I have uh, been doing. Okay. So what does 
leadership uh, look like? Um, when I think about this question, um, the first person that comes uh, to my mind is um, Michelle Obama. Um, she's affectionately known as the forever first lady of the United States. And um, to me, she's the perfect example for me as a leader, both personally and publicly. Um, she has many leadership roles um, and she's a mother, a lawyer, a community activist, um, a social rights advocate, and she has become a role model globally in inspiring not just her nation, but the, the entire world. And um, she said that um, leadership is not limited to age or status in life. And what I can take from that is the fact that anyone can be a leader and enact positive change. It's not limited to people in management or power positions, but successful leadership in particular um, comes from um, within, uh, within an individual. So having the right morals and the right values uh, that you can apply for the greater good. And just like me, she is a, she's a woman and she's black and I'm able to identify uh, with her journey. So let's have a look at my leadership journey uh, to date. Okay. Okay, so here are some of my uh, career highlights, which I'm honored and um, happy to share with you all. Sorry, can you see that page okay? Oh, just a moment, please. I think my battery is... Seems to be low. <laughs> Apologize. You okay. Um, so, uh, as you can see, they range from a range of national and international uh, positions. Um, and in each of these academic institutions and organizations, I always sought to enact meaningful change um, without even having lead in my in my title. Um, so, for example, uh, bottom right, um, being my most recent position at uh, University College um, London, um, in the capacity as an honorary research associate, I was also an, an EDI, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Advocate, and um, postgraduate tutor at the Institute of Health Informatics for master's students who are undertaking a master's in health informatics or data analytics. Um, and in this capacity, I served as a mentor and a personal tutor. I served on the Athena Swan Committee as well to also help raise awareness about gender inequality in academia. Um, another example um, the bottom, at the bottom is the um, World Health Summit. Um, so I was invited to the World Health Summit in Berlin in October of 2019, just last year. Um, and in this capacity, in my role, um, I was able to, I was invited to engage in collective discussions um, with global leaders on how we can find solutions to global health challenges. And, and for me, that meant highlighting how um, we can maximize the potential of digital capabilities, um, but more importantly, providing uh, diversity of thought. Um, and I guess uh, another, uh, important highlight that I would like to highlight is um, the fact that I, I volunteer as, as a STEM ambassador and I volunteer to help support and um, engage with young people pursuing STEM subjects and um, for me it's important once you're invited um, into a room to, sure that, to ensure that, that that door remains open for others, for other people like me to be able to um, feel welcomed. Okay. So you've seen that I have um, quite some colorful highlights, um, but what have been the challenges that, that I have faced? Um, so, here are, so here are three um, that I'm going to expand on. Uh, so firstly, at times when I would walk into to a room, um, I will be the only woman. Um, the field that I'm in um, is, is quite, um, male dominated and um, as you can see in 2018 only 13% of the UK STEM workforce was female. Um, now in 2020 um, it has increased to 22% which is something to be celebrated but we need to ensure that young girls and women take up STEM subjects and uh, professions. 
secondly, likewise, um, in many professional settings in my field, um, I would only I would be the only person of color. Um, although it's not entirely surprising, given that even at the highest level of academia, um, less than one percent of uh, professors are black. Um, and so I had to learn very quickly uh, the need to ensure that I advocate for my voice to be heard um, in several settings and to not be afraid to do so despite there being a lack of representation. Um, and thirdly, uh, the need to be able to break um, down stereotypes. So given that there are these gender and ethnic differences, I learned very quickly um, the need to remain focused on my goals, uh, to work diligently with integrity and let your work speak for yourself um, and clearly, uh, I believe that um, given my previous career highlights, um, you've, this strategy clearly works. Um, okay, so when I also transitioned to uh, industry uh, from academia, which is, I would say, it's the non-traditional route for PhDs, um, but I was very excited to, uh, to enter in the, into the industry arena. Um, many of the hurdles I faced, um, I still faced, they were still there. And so one of the, I would say, superpowers that I realized I had was hypervisibility um, and being able to flip the narrative to your advantage. Um, for example, um, I can't change the color of my skin um, and I wouldn't want to, let me add that. Um, so you have to let your work um, speak louder than any expectations that others may have of you, of your race or your gender. Okay, so moving on to how I overcame uh, some of the challenges that I faced. So in using this power, um, here are some of the top uh, tips that I, that I use to overcome some of the, the barriers. So firstly, um, knowing your, your values um, and being grounded and rooted in who you are um, and being proud of who you are and um, also like, honing in on some of the, the values that you have. For, for me, that was integrity, um, dignity, and taking pride in all I do. Um, and that includes celebrating your achievements, clapping for yourself, even when nobody is clapping for you. And um, that in particular, celebrating every milestone. No milestone is insignificant. Um, that's something I've learned to help overcome um, some of the challenges I've faced. Um, secondly, uh, external, uh, perceptions. Don't let um, other people's perceptions of you limit your ambitions. Yes, you may be a, a minority, but as I say, you can flip that um, to your advantage. So don't let anybody's expectations of you limit yourself and your ambitions. Um, thirdly, I would say uh, expand your network. To all the young people that are listening um, on this webinar, I would encourage you uh, to expand your network. There are several um, options available, uh, be it professional network, a staff network, um, a social network, which e each have their own um, advantages. Um, for example, um, in my career, I've belonged to the, the BME network, which is the Black and Minority Ethnic Network in the NHS. Um, and it offered me, for me, a safe space to feel empowered, um, to connect with uh, like-minded people. I was offered training and advice and mentorship opportunities, which are crucial to your development as a leader. Um, and you can also identify allies as well, which you can use to your greatest advantage. Um, but most importantly, I think a note in terms of networking is that it helps to expose you to more opportunities um, linking to people with similar interests. And the better you network, uh, the more knowledge you can tap into. Um, so that's what I've learned about um, uh, networking. Um, fourthly, uh, I would say um, honing on your support system. It's so important, it's crucial to have a support system in place. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, personally for me, uh, I think what has made all the difference has been um, my family. Now, it doesn't matter how small your support system is, even if it's just one person, it makes such a difference. Um, for me, it helped me to have the backing to, to, to progress in my career boldly and unapologetically, and I found that to be invaluable, um, especially in academia. The fact that there is a lack of representation, um, it, it is common, in fact, even um, in the non-BME community to experience imposter syndrome. Um, and, and we know from imposter syndrome, it doesn't still fear 
the fear that you may not be worthy to be in the position that you're in. Um, but having my support system in place helped to dispel that fear. And it's important to continue to believe in yourself. Uh, fifthly, I would say um, be proactive. Um, given that we, especially now we're in a uh, pandemic um, and traditional ways of working have been challenged. Um, so it's very important. Now there may not be uh, opportunities available um, that, you, that are readily available, but you are able to create your own opportunities, be creative um, and believe in yourself as you, as you embark on these opportunities as well. Um, six, I think this is most um, important, taking care of, of yourself. Um, so um, negativity, um, it has, um, research has proven that negativity can um, weaken your immune system. So it's so important for you to take care of yourself um, because your mind exerts power over the body. And um, I've seen in a recent report published uh, earlier this year by the um, British Educational Research Association that doctoral students from BME backgrounds um, experience increased unique challenges that can um, increase stress and worsen mental health. So it's so important to put yourself first um, and, and take care of yourself along your, alongside your journey or uh, um, leadership journey. Um, and lastly, um, in all that you do, uh, remember that regardless of your title or your status, that you are a leader um, and you are able to, to enact um, meaningful change in any capacity. Um, and so I like to, to lead by inspiring others and, um, and that's um, why I created and founded um, the PhD podcast. Now, um, the PhD podcast, um, I'm excited to say, is, is a global platform for PhD students and early career researchers to come together and share experiences and learn, learn and draw inspiration from each other. Um, in the podcast, I discuss all things PhD life um, and progressive ideas to create a way forward in academia that's more inclusive, equal and diverse. Um, I really like to emphasize the fact that it's not one dimensional because of the, there are um, many channels out there already that provide an insight into academic life as a PhD student or as a postdoc or as an early career researcher. However, there's a serious lack of representation. So um, this forum opens up to um, diverse conversations. And so it's available on um, YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter at the PhD podcast. We also have our um, own website, which is www.thephdpodcast.com. And um, so our ultimate vision um, as well as part of uh, the, the platform, or well, my ultimate vision is to um, have a positive impact that will inspire and empower people to maximize their potential. And um, we host um, Q and A's. Um, we also have interviews with special guests, international guests from around the world. It's very much an interactive um, space. Um, so I really um, implore uh, all the young people out there to, to have a look and follow us. We have a steady following on Instagram and on Twitter at the moment. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, let me just see the questions that we have in and some questions that we also had um, uh, previously come in to ask you. I will just start off by asking you, um, we've mentioned early before that you won the first place um, award in the World Congress in the field of um, uh, health and biomedical informatics. Tell us, like, you know, I can imagine going through a journey like that, there must have been highs and lows. Could you share more with us about that particular journey? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a, a very interesting question. Uh, the journey in itself, as I reflect on it, um, it was it's, it's a journey that um, I found to be uh, very rewarding. Um, and I think it, it presented an opportunity for me to um, engage with world leaders in, the, in my field of um, health and biomedical informatics. Um, and um, I would say the highs of the journey were the fact that um, 
I, I was able to, to set goals in terms of my research and I was able to meet those goals and surpass my potential. Um, and, and that brought me um, to various um, areas and various, it took me to various countries. Uh, specifically, it took me to, to Brazil where I was able to, to meet world leaders um, in my field. Um, I think that was the greatest, uh, one of the greatest achievements of my career to date. I was also able to share that journey with my family who also traveled with me. Uh, so that's my support system that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. That's very important for you to have um, a level of support or a support circle in place. Um, so um, I would say I didn't experience um, any lows in particular, but I would say that something um, which I learned very early on in my in my academic career is that um, you're constantly being judged um, in terms of the quality of your work. And, and that's something um, that can be viewed as a negative, but I don't think it should be viewed as a negative. I think it should be used, uh, it could be uh, used as a positive to help you, to push you, to continue to strive uh, for better. And, and obviously um, I'm still on my leadership journey. So there's no stopping me at this moment in time. Okay, excellent. Um, the next question we have coming in is actually, um, uh, with the, like with many institutions, for instance, NHR launching calls on artificial intelligence and health and care rewards, there is a focus now more than ever in technological advance advancements. Now you have a PhD in digital health innovations. Could you tell us what your exact involvement is within this sector and why is it so important? Um, uh, it's so important um, for, for various reasons. Um, I've just finished um, working on a unique uh, project um, with uh, University College London Hospitals. And um, in my role um, as a digital health lead, um, I was involved in a project which looked at combining um, an electronic health record, the UK's first, shall I mention, the UK's first integrated electronic health record with a clinical trials um, platform. Um, so that enables um, people, uh, patients to be um, selected for clinical trials within the NHS that they're eligible to take part in uh, according to data that's held within their electronic health record. And it's underpinned by strong um, clinical informatics principles, that being artificial intelligence and um, natural language processing. Um, so the capabilities of artificial intelligence are, are limitless. And I'm, I'm enjoying being and working at the forefront of uh, innovation. Great, excellent. Um, actually, on the back of that, we have another question coming in, um, which asks, um, I noticed one of your experiences was at McHill. What was the transition of moving across the world like for you, especially when it comes to building new networks and moving to a different place? That, that's a very good question. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't see who asked the question. Uh, so um, in direct- Someone called Love and Molid. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a very good in question, especially for young people who would like to be seeking out um, training and fellowship opportunities. So this was a, a training fellowship opportunity that was a competitive opportunity um, and um, only a certain level of awards were being um, provided, uh, presented to, to um, PhD students who have a vision of uh, mobilizing um, around the world and um, I was fortunate to be awarded one of those uh, research um, positions. Now um, I think there are there are several um, elements uh, involved when you're, you're moving to a new country or um, when you when you need to build new networks. Um, I think the first things first is to make sure that you research the institution that you want to, to join. Um, I joined an, an informatics lab um, where I researched the, the supervisors um, I also um, researched the area that I was going to be staying in and living in, and that's very important uh, for me um, uh, as a woman of colour as well. Um, and um, it presented limitless opportunities. From there, I was able to um, I was able to to um, be involved in projects that they were working on, and it helped to elevate my profile as a researcher and also elevate myself in the field as an academic. Um, and I think it, it's just it's an added um, bonus to your career if you're able to do that and grab those opportunities. So to young people out there, I would say continue to seek out opportunities, grab opportunities as you see them, don't limit yourself at all. Okay, 
Um, just one last question, and I'm wary of time as well. One question that we received through Twitter, which was, how important would you say mentorship was a part of your journey? If you can briefly comment on that. Um, perfect, yeah, mentorship uh, was significant for me. Um, as I say, um, especially to be able to see role models out there. Um, it's very difficult to envision yourself in a position um, of, of leadership, for example, if you, if you don't readily see that. Um, and so for me, it's very important to be able to seek out opportunities for me, and I still do uh, till today, um, and also be able to, to mentor others. Um, uh, and, I, and I do that in the work at, that I do. I, I make sure that, as I said, once I'm through a door, that, that door is left open so other people are able to follow and feel welcomed and um, to receive training and advice and support to help them elevate themselves in their journey. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. No, excellent. Um, so up next, we have Professor Eric Herring. Um, he's a professor of world politics at University of Bristol. This man has worked both in Somalia, in Somalia and Somalia, and there's a plethora of experiences on, in his portfolio. So I would just like to give it over to him because he will discuss some of the key projects that he's worked on and talk about what leadership means to him. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the, the invitation. I really uh, appreciate it um, uh, and uh, I'll do my best to give you something useful. So uh, the first thing to say is that I'm a, I'm a privileged old white guy. Right? So um, how did I get where I did today? Well, privilege is a massive part of the story. Um, class privilege, race privilege, uh, gender privilege. So, you know, I'm ticking all the easy boxes. So I'm really not the person to be telling you about how all my wonderful achievements kind of thing because, because really I had everything weighted on my side. Maybe being Scottish got in the way a bit, but, uh, but apart from that, um, you know, the old line about, you know, English is my second language as I come from Scotland. Um, but, um, but so I've had those advantages uh, on my side. Um, and I think I want to start out by talking about some of the difficulties you face if you're interested in, in, in getting into academia and getting into a leadership role. So the first is that there's a tiny percentage of those who, who no matter how good they are, get their PhD, very tiny percentage become a full professor. It's just the, the, it's, the, the funnel is so tiny that we're talking, I mean, the figures vary, but we're talking single figures percentages. Uh, so, so no matter how good you are and dedicated and do everything right, a tiny percentage will get there. That's just, that's just how the structure is. Then the second thing you, problem you've got is casualization. So um, the vast majority of postdocs in the UK and um, in all fields are in precarious employment, short-term contracts, nine-month contracts, 10-month contracts, renewal every year, project-based. I mean, so, so the casualization of the sector is a blight on the sector. And, you know, so the, the, um, most academics, even in top institutions in the UK, are in, on insecure contracts, uh, one-year contract, two-year contracts, and so on. So it's a fairly grim prospect. Um, and on top of that, you face racism. I mean, there's outright, bare-faced, direct racism uh, personal racism that there will be in your face, um, but also all the structural racism that you will face. So if you have the same two CVs and uh, one of them with a black sounding name and the other with a white sounding name, then the white sounding name person gets the jobs uh, before. I mean, so you've got all of those barriers. So if you want to get into a, po a position of leadership, the first thing is to understand what you're up against. Uh, and those barriers are huge. Uh, and so uh, you shouldn't put all the emphasis on yourself. You shouldn't give yourself a hard time. You should understand that you're up against it from the start. Um, and, and for that, I apologize for the structure of our society. It's therefore uh, requires people like me to do a lot more, people who are in a position of privilege. Um, and so, um, say a few things about what, what, I, what I'm trying to do. Um, but if I were going to give you one piece of advice about how to advance your academic career, it would be get yourself a mentor, 
a sponsor. That, that will overcome most barriers for you. Because for instance, if I back my PhD students to get jobs, to get money, to get into various activities, I'm the person that sends the extra email. I'm the person who makes the extra phone call. I'm the person who can make it happen for a significant number of people because I've already got that position. I'm the person who's got the funded projects that I can invite people onto. So really you have to find a mentor, a backer, a senior person as a sponsor and that will make a, a massive difference uh, to you. Um, so I haven't really said it much yet about, about what I do. You may be wondering what, who I am, what I, what I do. So I'll say a few words about what I do. So as a professor of world, world politics, um, what I'm interested in is the connections between the very local all the way up to the global. And the way I work is that uh, I have a Somali social enterprise partner organization called Transparency Solutions led by um, Latif Ismail, a former uh, Somali refugee uh, to the UK. I met him as a student here. We work together all the time. Now, I fundamentally lack capability. I lack capacity. I don't speak Somali. But my Somali partners understand the context a lot better than me. I listen to what they've got to say. So the way I work with Somali partners and operate at this international level is that in academia, I'm my own expert. But in the operating in, a, in an international environment, I know that I have to spend an enormous amount of time just listening uh, and often just sitting while people have discussions in Somali um, and I wait to be involved. So what I try to do is bring together the skills that I have with the skills and capacities that my partners in Somalia have or Somaliland have and then work at what we can do together and we build those agendas together. I also believe and know that, that people of every social category have a lot to offer. So in my work, what, um, we do co-production, where you do research not only for people, but with people. And so that research will include, so we're working currently at the moment with people in Somali and Somali around who are illiterate, who are IDPs, who are refugees, who are a minority clan, who are uh, nomadic pastoralists, who are rural agriculturalists, who are uh, uh, disempowered youth, young women, uh, um, people who are small informal traders, uh, people who are gabuya, um, in other words, low caste workers who do are barbers and uh, leather workers and steel workers and so on. When we work with them in our projects, and we include in people who, for instance, they mainly speak the Mai dialect rather than uh, Somali as their first language. Um, uh, and we work with them in our projects and we go to them on the fundamental belief that they have something to offer, that they know a lot. They are, these are people who have managed to survive in incredibly difficult circumstances. They have a lot to teach people like me. So what, what, what we do is we go to people and we ask and say, Will you work with us? So for instance, on COVID-19 response, the research we're doing at the moment, what we're asking people is, what have you done um, uh, in the situation to respond to the crisis? How has it affected your livelihood? How has it affected your life? How has it affected your social category? What do you think of what has been done? What more do you think could be done? Um, what do you think, are you, are you, for instance, scared to go to the hospitals? Why might you be? And what we do is we ask a round of questions and we gather in this knowledge uh, and then we go back to people and we say, uh, and we actually ask people, um, is this what you meant? These are the patterns we're seeing, do you agree? And we, we actually ask them to rate us. We ask them to say, we ask, are we asking the right questions? Are we asking them in the right way? Is there anything you need us to do differently? And if you had to score us out of five, where would you score us? And what do you think we're doing well? And what do you think we need to improve? And as we go along, therefore, our participants gain confidence in, in what they're doing. And, and, and actually, we learn a huge amount about what's happening in relation to COVID-19 simply by, by doing this kind of work. 
Uh, so we start from the position that people have a huge amount to offer. Uh, it's amazing what you, what you can learn. Um, so I'm not a public health scholar, but I understand wider political processes. And to me, um, I, I remember a public health academic said to me about a year ago that public health is public. Everyone owns it. And therefore, it's not just a field for the experts. The experts are part of the story, but everyone should be able to be part of the public health conversation. And so you should be willing to be involved in that conversation. And I just thought that that really, I found that very personally quite freeing to become involved in these uh, activities. Um, and so um, I'm also involved in the Benadir Regional Administration COVID-19 Task Force. And what that does is it's trying to organize at, at the 17 district level in Mogadishu um, COVID-19 response for um, nearly 2 million urban poor and IDPs. And what they're, what they're doing is surveying the area, doing, believe it or not, 400,000 uh, household level interviews over the next six weeks to understand what people's thoughts and perceptions and needs are to work out how we can respond to that. On the, and, and I do quite a lot of the research. So we actually have people in the various districts. And my research teams get in touch with them and ask them various questions. So we had an amazing story recently where um, I'm keeping an eye on time. So I know I'm, on, I'm still within my 15 minutes. Um, but so um, we had an amazing thing recently where, where, where uh, there were some uh, community health centers set up in Mogadishu and we were kind of expecting them to be swamped. And they had six people in them, the capacity for something like 126 people and they had six people and we're going, why is no one coming? Uh, and uh, so we asked our, um, our participants and they, they, and they told us the reason. And it says, well, look, we don't know if we're going to be allowed out again if we go in here. We think the quality of the healthcare is going to be terrible. We don't even know if we can get food. We don't know if we're going to be charged for, for the services and we have no money. There's no way we're going to these places. And not only that, they said, we're, a lot of people around us think that once you've had COVID-19, you're permanently infectious and therefore you're always a threat. So this is not about stigma, it's about fear, the fear around them. And, and so people's decision not to go to these hospitals was rational. And it's so easy to dismiss people's uh, responses to the public health situation as based on ignorance, illiteracy, I've seen too much research on this situation where, where researchers have found gaps in people's knowledge and gone, ha, see the public, how stupid are they? They didn't realize that A, B, and C, they haven't got some piece of expert knowledge. But actually to realize that what we found in our work was people had a good fundamental working knowledge, even though there were myths and misconceptions and things that needed to be addressed, but, but it's really, but public health will fail if you're not working with the public. And I saw um, an amazing thing that Aisha did on, um, I watched the video um, on uh, vaccinations with the Somali community where she was talking about why vaccinations matter and how important it was to get vaccinated and how she dealt with the myths and met with people afterwards to make sure they understood. So um, that kind of level of, trusted engagement um, shows what can be achieved through research combined with how people actually live their lives and how they think. And I guess for me, if you're, I would say that if I had to boil down what leadership is about for me, it was what someone once said to me is that if you really want to be a leader, you've got to explain to people how to follow. A leader without followers is, is, is just a lunatic in a corner talking about how they're a, they're a leader. We're, and, and I've really taken that to heart. And then the next thing I suppose I thought about was, if you want someone to follow something, you, it can't be just what you do and how you do it. You've got to work out what suits them. So that, so that the thing they're doing, that they're comfortable with, because there are different roles in life that people prefer doing. And then it's about ownership. Everyone owns what you do. And people come alive 
whenever they feel that they own something, whenever they're part of it. And so you, so you start, and, and when I run projects, I try and concentrate on a number of, of things. Um, so the projects that work well are the one that are, first of all, the ethics are right. You're doing it for good, for the right reason. The second thing for me is that it's about precision. You've got to do everything properly and, and accurately across the project. Then the third thing um, is coordination across. Everyone needs to be having a voice in making this all, all, all work. Um, and, um, and then everyone needs to own the big picture because it's only by interpreting the big picture do they understand. Um, and then finally, put people's names on things. An organizational name isn't the same as everyone's name being on it. And this is where traditional academia falls down, where they think the big name first, right? Well, as long as, I mean, I get the idea that you're entitled to most credit, but you really need to broaden out the, the scope of all these things so that everyone truly, truly owns it. And then finally, as the leader is, you have to mean it. Yeah, when you say you want everyone involved and you really want to care about what they think, that means actually going to people and, and making sure they understand that. And my time's up, I'll just finish with an example. One of our uh, uh, respondents who's an illiterate person, uh, uh, an IDP in Mogadishu, asked the question of one of our team, was an idea they had about, about disposing of face masks going to be in the report? I made sure our team member phoned that person back and told them, yes, absolutely, your line will be in the report. And if, if we're not prepared to answer that call, then we shouldn't be doing the work. So I, I hope you found that useful. That's my 15 minutes. Fastly, thank you very much, Eric. And we just have an applause on that. Thank you. thank you very much for that. Um, I can personally say that your talk resonated very deeply with myself, and I think it has with many of the individuals within our within our audience. Um, and one of the questions that actually came back touches on something that you were discussing, which is around um, uh, the 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 lack of a the emphasis. Sorry, in the in terms of when it comes to academia, I mean, you mentioned something like. Um, uh, um, you mentioned things around like if, if you want to get far you need to know what you're up against um, for instance right now in this question it says i came across a path in academia identifying things such as like individuals as indigenous knowledge or dismissing the traditional non-academic roots now do you see a change within the academic discourse regarding this narrative is there a critical discussion within academia concerning this indigenization of traditional knowledge uh, so I would say that the, the, that conversation is there and, and there's some amazing academics out there. So the question is finding out who those amazing ones are uh, and, and, who, and, and uh, who, to, who to connect to. Uh, and it's knowing the literature and knowing who the good people are, because there'd be people who are just not interested. But there, equally, there is, there, is the, there, is, there are plenty of ones, especially those who've who've got more of an anthropological influence in their work or who do more engaged public health. People like Aisha are a perfect example. Um, uh, so, so they are out there. And, but, but in a sense, those strands, there'll be people who are just not interested. So it's finding out, in a sense, if you want to know some, what someone's like, look at what they've done, because that's who they are. They're not gonna become something else. So find out what that person is and what they have done. And, and to be honest, if they've got that track record of doing that kind of thing, you can have, have, have faith. Well, um, I, I, actually, I think I clicked on the wrong thing. Someone was asking for contact details. So I'm really happy for anyone on here to contact me. It's like my email, if you Google Eric Herring, it's a, it's a stupid name. There's not many of me around. It's very easy to find, uh, but it's eric.herring at bristol.ac.uk. For those individuals who want, like, you know, um, of course, like with the speakers agreeing with it, for those individuals who want contact details, we will follow up with emails. Um, the other thing that we wanted to ask you as well was, um, you explained you have to find the right individuals. I mean, you're someone who not only did you recognize, for instance, I am where I'm at because of the specific privileges that I've had, but you also took action. Now, considering like when we look at academia and we know that the percentage of, say, black individuals are like, I think it's less than 1%, especially when it comes to elite positions. How do we ensure that our 
non-black counterparts recognize this, but not only recognize it, but actually take coordinated action because there's no point in saying one individual recognizes, mm -hmm. okay, I have this privilege, I'm going to take action. How do we get others, our peers, to actually take a collective, um, like make a collective, uh, um, yeah, so take a collective action. Organize, so organize alliances. This is a wonderful time. So the, the anti-racism in UK universities is exploding. I'm so happy about it. So for instance, within the University of Bristol, we have something called Decolonize UOB. It's huge, it's, that, it's about thousands of people in the university already. And we've got about nine working groups going working right across the entire institution. Uh, and, it, and so organize and find out who, who, who are doing those things. Well, you're right, it, it, so it's these institutional, this is a wonderful potential moment for institutional change to challenge institutional racism. I, I'm really quite hopeful. Oh, you, you're silent, Aisha. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Fine. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, for that, Eric. Um, we have all of the questions. We've got all the questions answered. Your talk again. I would just like to reiterate. It was incredibly insightful. It resonated deeply um, with all of us, and we are very much looking forward to following up conversations like this in the future, whether it's within work in academia or just general things such as bridging the gap of distrust between healthcare providers or public health services and the community. So, on that note, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Okay. Um, so. The next individual that we have coming up um, is Mr. Anders Thompson. He's currently the UNFP representative to Somalia. And while his experience include over 25 years in development and the humanitarian assistance, what resonates so deeply with a lot of Somalians, especially within the community, is that he's a champion and advocate for the three zeros, which is zero maternal mortality, zero unmet family planning, and zero gender-based violence in Somalia. Please help me welcoming um, uh, Anders. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aisha. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate you and the other speakers. I think that uh, Somali academics putting on this show and really passing the buck or paying it forward, as Ruth was saying, or sending the elevator back down. There are many uh, sort of analogies for how uh, you actually are trying to uh, provide an environment that will really uh, empower young people to assume uh, leadership and practice uh, leadership. So I, I really want to congratulate you for that. And thank you for inviting me. I hope, um, I hope I'll be able to uh, uh, contribute to the conversation in, in one way or another. Um, let me just say that uh, UNFPA, uh, United Nations Population Fund, uh, our mandate, as you said, uh, Dr. Asha, is really about uh, helping women. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in my case, all Somali women. So if the Somali women succeed, I succeed. Basically, that is my role. And that is how I also frame my own leadership uh, style. And I'll come back to that. In Somalia, uh, we have actually further developed the concept of the three zeros. Uh, we, we call it four zeros. We call it zero maternal mortality, uh, zero uh, unmet need for family planning and zero GBV, but we have also added the uh, quest for zero FGM. We don't want a single girl to be cut in, in Somalia. Uh, we think that about 200,000 girls might be cut in 2020. And actually because of the COVID-19, we have seen that girls out of school and, and uh, and the, the campaigns to knock on doors and, and actually uh, promote this practice is, is something that has been um, uh, ongoing. So um, let, let, me, let me come back to, to the, um, we, we can come back to our work and, and what we try to do in Somalia to really make a difference. 
uh, I think leadership is, is about making a difference. Uh, that's how I approach my own role. Uh, but it's funny when you say, what is leadership within the UN? I, I must say that that is, you, you, I don't even think you realize how challenging that question is when you pose it. Because the United Nations, unfortunately, is a big, messy organization with people from all walks of life. It's very politicized. Uh, when people have a position in the United Nations, they may not necessarily get it because of merit. I mean, we say that, but I can say that in this, this forum that it's not always based uh, on merit. It might be based on uh, racial factors. It might be based on mostly political factors who are contributing to the UN, or if you are maybe from the South, you might be part of a political elite and you, you get pushed into to a, a position, right? So let's be honest about that. I, I have no problem <laughs> sort of uh, disguising that and taking the veil off the, the UN to be able to, to give something to the audience here. So uh, what, what is leadership? Uh, leadership is obviously has been said it's not about a leadership position right but when people talk about the united nations it's always it's often about oh how can i get one of those positions right uh, and that is politicized and that is uh, messy and that's not what leadership should be about uh, and that was established by ruth it was established by eric so uh, i can say that in my approach to leadership in Somalia, where I work now, I previously worked in Palestine, I worked in India, uh, in other contexts that I, I really approach leadership uh, in the same way, no matter where I am. I mean, a lot of people always ask me, so how is it being leader in Somalia? And I said, what do you mean? As if it's different than anywhere else. At the end of the day, uh, most people have the same set of uh, ambitions. They want to be fulfilled, they want to feel belonging, and they want to succeed. So when I am a leader and I have this position, uh, it's not because of the position, it is that my role, my practice is to make sure that those things are fulfilled for the people that are within my team and for the people that we serve as a team. So in Somalia, we have about uh, 80 colleagues on the team. I want each of them to become a leader. A leader on going to communities to talk about how can we uh, abandon FGM. Uh, a leader to go and talk to the politicians or the people in the ministry. How can we make sure that when we talk uh, sexual reproductive rights, that something as simple as a woman coming into a hospital in Banadir wanting a C-section to save her life can actually get it without male consent. Because that is the circumstance right now that she can only get it with male consent. And often they come in, uh, the doctor will try to, to, to call the husband on the phone. Maybe they didn't get credits on the phone. They can't be reached for whatever reason. Uh, and guess what? The woman dies. Uh, so when we talk about these rights issues, it, it's very, very basic, right? So, so with my team, I, I, I tell everyone, I, the, everyone is special, everyone has a role. Of course, they, 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 they have to want to do the job. So I become an enabler and I, when I talk about leading my team, I do it by invitation. It, I, I came up, I don't know if I came up with this concept before the talk, leadership by invitation. I invite everyone to become a success in their own right so they can show leadership with the partners, show leadership with the community. I want to help them, I want to mentor them uh, and I wanna make sure that they feel uh, that they can uh, provide that service to others. And th that, that is not easy. It, it, it takes hard work, it takes practice, uh, it takes um, changing habits where you show empathy, where you are listening, where you, where you put others before yourself. Uh, and th that's not easy, that's not easy. Uh, some 
of you, many, I think millennials are, are looking at leadership literature right now and uh, probably know Simon Sinek, who, who is one of the foremost thinkers on leadership. And he has written a book, book that uh, real leaders eat last. And that uh, was something coined from a, from a context where if there's not enough food in the team, literally you provide for your team and you eat last. It also means that if you have to, uh, if there is a situation where everyone has something else to do, but something has to be done, even it's a mundane uh, piece of work, driving a car to somewhere, getting someone uh, enabled to do something, you as the leader, you also have to play that role. You have to do that. You have to eat last. And if you're not willing to do that, uh, you then you're not practicing leadership. I'm not saying that you can't change your habits, but you need to then change your habits. And the way I got into this, someone uh, was saying, I think it was Eric, the, the best advice of this whole seminar is get a good mentor. Get a good mentor. A lot of people think, oh, I want to work for organization X or company X, and this is, or hospital X, and that's gonna be uh, what is going to make my career. You need to choose your leader, choose the person you want to work for. I know many human resources systems don't allow that because you have to apply and go through different um, uh, processes, etc. You never know necessarily who your, your leader will be. But if you can choose your leader, choose your leader because it's going to be much more important than the company you work for. Because many of these big establishments, they take the young people and they, they wring out all the juice out of them a couple of years. A lot of people have almost like uh, post-traumatic uh, syndrome after working in some of these very high competitive organizations uh, after some years and, and they sort of give up. And all the bad habits of these exploitative practices, which happens across the board, uh, they, they, then you internalize it and you perpetuate and you become a terrible leader yourself, right? So avoid that. I've had the fortune uh, in the United Nations of having a boss who wanted me to succeed and who was really mentoring me. But later in my career, I also uh, met my worst nightmare. I had a boss for uh, a couple of years I can unfortunately not disclose here the circumstances around it, right? But who was really, really antagonizing me, who was really trying to push me uh, out and, and sort of kill me professionally. Uh, and I, it took me a while to recover from that, but it did, did teach me one thing, the person not to be. And, and having that yin yang of, of the good boss and the bad boss, uh, maybe you could write a book about the good boss and the bad boss. It would probably be a bestseller somehow, right? But that yin yang really helped me uh, form my, my own leadership style. So um, I'm not sure I can help uh, the listeners or the, the young people how to get that leadership position in the UN. Apply if you're doing good work. You, you, you start as a UNV, UN volunteer. It's actually a paid position uh, and they're trying to really get a lot of new talent in. But uh, if you come into the United Nations and, and, uh, and work in the United Nations, at least practice good leadership, exercise good leadership, don't be that uh, bad leader. And uh, before the seminar, I was, I was sort of going back over notes of leadership from my past history. There's a company in Denmark, I'm from Denmark. It just happens to be there from Denmark. It's called Devo Team, it's a consulting company. Could be any other company. It's, it's not a big company. They maybe have 80, 100 people. But every year the employees are asked to, by vote, choose who should be the leader. Can you imagine? So you're chosen to be the leader. Now, in the United Nations, it's a very hierarchical system. You know, you call youth officer, for example, or program officer. I mean, we have this 
nomenclature for from uh, so outdated, you know, from the from the military, right? But what I hope and what I strive to every day is that uh, uh, approach it, and I even say to the uh, to to other leaders on my team, I'm a leader of leaders, right? I, I say you have to work in a way with your team that they would want to vote for you. Like in this example of, of uh, the consulting company, Devo Team. You may have gotten a position which gives you certain entitlements uh, and certain power as it were, but you have to treat all your subordinates uh, in such a way that they, if, if they came to a vote, which of course doesn't happen in the UN, but if it did, that they would want to vote for you. And that's also how uh, I, I, uh, I approach my own work with my own team. So if, if all of these people are enabled, if they all feel that, that I am there to make them succeed, guess what? They will do like Ruth said, they will pay it forward. They will pay it forward to the community. And that is how we can actually uh, change the world together. Uh, and that's how I approach leadership uh, in uh, the United Nations. So uh, there was the third question, how do you use your difference to advantage? I think that is perhaps the, the difference that I have to offer, uh, and I hope it will soon be normalized. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. That talk was very um, uh, informational. One of the questions that we actually have also here from our audience is, um, when it comes to, for instance, working in a highly political and politicized system, especially within the UN, when it comes to Somalia, how do you, as an individual, maintain your innovative, your, your innovation, your creativeness, um, your ability to be bold about certain aspects? How do you maintain that when you know you are in a fairly rigid system? Um, it's a very good question. I think you have to you have, you have give, to give room for people to pursue their own ideas. And again, this is leadership by invitation. If I see if I see someone has a good idea and they believe in it, it is my role to see that they can succeed with it. Uh, we have had examples of people where I didn't know where it was going to go. I have to. Yeah. be able to afford taking that risk and say, look, it, it doesn't matter if it fails, you know, if it fails, then try again. Another analogy from sort of the venture capitalist, you know, I mean, is it not that I have venture capitalism here, but th there is a mindset there, if you're George Soros or some of these that in invest in companies, right? So the two things I read a book about uh, this thing, and they say, okay, I, I invest in uh, 10 companies, 10 ideas, basically. If two, of them, if two of them succeed, I'm happy because usually these are ideas that will change lives. So it doesn't matter whether it failures. And uh, that, that is a philosophy I'm trying to apply. Now, the, the UN is very risk adverse as a system. So it's, it's not always easy. But at an individual level with people, you, you, you have to give room for people to fail and to uh, try to pursue their own ideas and, and, and try to support them in, 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 and guide them in, in, in getting there. So, so that is uh, at least one way that, that it can be done, um, but, but it has to be enabled again from the top. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Anders. Another question that, you, that we have as well is um, uh, when you go about applying for leadership roles, such as yours or others within the organization, especially in Somalia, is there a level of experience you need before you can relocate to another country? What would you advise? Because there's many Somali students here that aspire to go back home to build and to invest their um, uh, skills back home. What kind of level do they need to be at before they can make such a decision, would you say? I think um, I mean, one of the things I want to say is that first and foremost, coming to Somalia is really such an amazing thing <laughs> because you have um, 
I've never seen, you know, I've been in Palestine, I've been in India, I've been, uh, I've been many places, South America, I've never seen a place where people are coming back this, the way I see Somalis to build their country, okay? Let's not forget that it is also something that can be source of conflict sometimes. Some people, they say, oh, these diaspora are coming back, we stayed here during the hard times, etc. right? So um, keep that in mind. Is, is one advice for, for diaspora coming back. Uh, but if you come with the mindset that you want to be an enabler um, and you want people locally to succeed, you will succeed. But because you come, and we have been talking about privilege as well, if you come as a, as a diaspora and because now you have gotten a better education, you speak languages, et cetera, and you have an edge, some people call it a privilege, right? But you have a privilege. Don't exploit that privilege. You will not su succeed, I don't think. So I don't think necessarily it's about degrees or diplomas. I think it's about how you approach going back, rebuilding Somalia. Absolutely. And just following on from that, especially when it comes to, it's not always about having a certain academic background. A lot of individuals bring um, a lot of individuals bring leadership simply through experience now but then when it comes to that these individuals often do experience things such as imposter syndrome how would you say for instance i know your background is right now is in international development it's in business however you're working at the unfpa how like you know if someone comes from a different background to what they're working in how would they deal with things such as imposter syndrome so, so such as imposter Sorry. imposter syndrome um, Imposter so syndrome, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's of course any. The, the 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 funny thing is that when you are part of an organization, whether it's an academic organization, whether it's a it's a, a Somali academics, or if it's a if it's a UNFP or UN, everyone wants to feel that they belong to something, right? Yeah. And if you are that, you know, you know how it is in an office, there is always someone who makes everyone feel good around the water cooler. It may not be the boss, but you know who I'm talking about, right? In every office, be that person. And, 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 uh, and, and it will happen. Oh, no, thank make, you very much. Make them, yeah. make, them, make them feel that they are a success. That, that's, that's what you can do and show that leadership, practice it, not by position, but by practice. Okay. Actually, we have time for one, one more last question, Anders. And that question is, do you think that the selection of leadership within the UN will change in the future? Oh, that is also another very deep question because I, I really hope so, right? I mean, it's a very complicated thing. What Antonio Gutierrez is doing right now, he's trying to really, um, make sure that we have um, gender um, uh, equity, right? Which I, I really applaud him for. And it makes it hard for, for people like myself because we, I'm, I'm at a wave where, where you know, we, people like me had privilege for a long time, but now we have to pass on, we have to pay it forward to others, right? Um, so I, I respect that. But, but and also the, you have so many, um, uh, nations who are, uh, whether it's donor countries or, or countries where it's a political lead, you, you, you get people in who may not be getting the job because what they practice and what they stand for, but because of the connections they have. It, it, is, um, it is happening. Uh, and I, but, I, but I also see, I also know why it is happening, but I truly, hope uh, that, I should, that, that, it, it, that it will change in, in some way and that we find a way to, to, to change that because it's actually one of the blemishes on, on the United Nations. Uh, and I think that a lot of young people uh, maybe listening out there might be discouraged from even trying to get in. But I would say, try, don't give up. Start as a UNV, UN International uh, Volunteer is a very good place to start. It's a program you are paid, 
uh, you, you're, you're basically put in a mentorship uh, and it's a very good way to start. And you can start at, at any age, any level, but it, it is a platform to get in, to get in and, and, and find a way to, to serve people and contribute to the United Nations the way it was supposed to be. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Anders. Um, thank you for joining us. And like your message resonates with all of us, and especially when it comes to be what what leader not to be. That's a personal point that I will always take, also take away. Um, now, in terms of timing, our next speaker. Thank as you, you can very see, much, Natasha. Thank you're you very much. welcome. You're very welcome, Anders. Um, so <laughs> our next speaker um, will be um, Dr. Marian Qasim. She has over 35 years of experience. She's a prominent figure. She's recognized internationally for her integral roles in arriving the Somali national educational system. Um, and please help me welcome, personally, my role model, Dr. Marian Qasim. Give me one second. Start video. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil uh, first of all, I would like to thank those young people who managed to bring all of us together in this uh, Zoom meeting. It was really amazing and uh, I want to say to them thank you. Again, the same thing, a big thank you to our panelists, the amazing panelists who shared their experiences. So thank you again. Today, my talk, I was told that uh, I have to speak about leadership, about the uh, public service uh, in Somalia and this stuff. But first of all, if I introduce myself, by training, I'm a medical doctor and obstetrician and gynecologist. My whole life, I worked in hospitals, night shifts, and teaching at universities until in 2010, I joined the Somali cabinet. Before that, I was a professional medical doctor. I'm a mother of six children. They are not any more children. Now all of them are grown up. And I am a grandma to seven amazing grandkids of whom the oldest is 12 years and the youngest is a newborn from my children and who are of different nationalities. <laughs> Leaving Somalia, some of the things, is it positive, negative, I don't know. But some of my grandchildren are Finnish, some are Swedish, some are British. So don't know if it is a negative or a positive, but it was due to moving out of our country due to the civil wars, due to going different places. So uh, today, my speech will be in Somali language, while 99% of the audience is Somali. But what does leadership mean to me? To me, leadership means credibility. You are not a leader if you don't have followers. And if those followers, they don't follow you out of their free will, out of love, out of trust, if it is not like that, you are not a leader. You can come, you can bring military, you can bring, you can by coup, you can conquer a country. Okay, you can be the king, you can be the president, you can be, but if people don't trust you, if people don't love you, if people don't listen to you, they are not your followers. So to me, leadership is that people trust you, people listen to you, people follow you. 
And that is credibility. When people see that you are a credible person, people, when they see that you are, what you are doing is for their benefit. Said that, I want to share some experiences, not from the politics, maybe in the question is if you ask me about the cabinet, but today I want to share with you personal stories which explain that to become a leader, you don't need nomination. You don't need to have a ministerial position. You don't need that, uh, to be a chairperson. Leadership is there all the time. If you feel the responsibility, starting from your household, as a, as a mother, as a father, as a sibling, starting from your household, through your university, through your community, when you see that there is a gap, when you take the responsibility to fill the gap, when you stand for your community. So in a nutshell, to become a loved leader, you don't need to be nominated by some entity to be a minister or somebody. So that's my understanding of leadership. Okay, I, I will change my speech to Somali because of the audience, 99% are Somalis and I want to share with them a lot of experiences outside of politics when I was just a simple person or when I was a number in a paper in a refugee camp or so I'm changing to Somali language. Okay. وحي إلاتهاي دادك أن لاحظ لاية وحي أبذيهين سومالي مركا وحان ربا إنا سومالي كوهدلو وحان ربا إنا إذن لوا ذاقو وحي ما داما أن إذن كوينا هاي أدون كان حوغا أن سو جوغي مدوين كاس ويا أراك نمادي أن سو قاتي إي وحي أن سو أركا سيدي آن شاقي با إنا داد كاقي هو قاميسو أما آد هو قامي آد نقطو أما ليدر آد نقطو دي أما باهند إنا بما عابو أما باهند إنا جاقا حيسيد أما باهند إنا دوزير أما مضح آتاي وإنا آد هتا دارينتو إنا مسؤولية دي كاسا رانتاي داد كاقا مسؤولية داس هتا قادة تودو استاكتو وات كسوا بحضو هو كامنت على شيء جاي معنى هذا أما ليدرشيب ك وأنا يدتك كأمني كران أدونك وحصوم عليك هو كامي يالك للدول ده آه لو جعلها إلا هذا تاريخ دول الله حصو هو مبعود أن لم أقل كرين مرك هو كامي حنا وان نقول كرتا هو كامي في عنا وان نقول كرتا هو كامي عن كحط لاجو وامتك اللي جعلها هاي وامتك هاي استمانت تذكرن أستغل قري عرديس إيو استعمالين دتك إيج عريين أو دتك إيج كسب أو كسب بنكر دتك دتك سير هو كسب بنكر تا سير هو رأي وشاعر وإن رمله هو بحتا وإن له وإن النقطة أفله كالصورة أنكر قري جا جا مركز كسر بلونه والدين تا وحاجرة والليدرشيب والدين ما نفكر كان مركا تاس ما أنت كمهد الله لكن حتى قريينا وحان دريما المهاجة مركا لا جوكتين المهاجة هديك أركان قفل مكة نصو نانكار إنا تهي قفل شيقة إنا تهي وحي نباتا هذي كولا إيمانا يان وحي أدو الشيكتان إنا يرونتا لكن مركا أركان عرورتي أدي قادة شيء دي وحكا أقاسو كي ما بلا مركا يكو أركان إنا لهرون الشيقة إنا مركا يكون أركان إنا نكون كالسونا كرين وضعه وسبع دلايا مركا تاسك عبد قادة مركا بلشو وين أدربت إنا ذو قال مسيد وقف داعك وأخب الشاد إنا وحان روا ما أنت إنا إذا لقى يفسده السيدة أكون نكون كرت الليدر أذي قوم مرحنا أنهين أذي قوم لونو من يتكريني ما دام وحان وظهر لينا إيتا شان يطبان دقيقة وحان رأينا إن اللقب صدق 
aniga Soomaaliya wax ku soo bartay waxbarashadeeda koow jaamacada laakiin kadib taqasusaad wadamo kale gaajisan ku sameey Holland iyo UK oo aan ku sameey Warwick Medical School ayada la taqasus laakiin originally waxaan wax ku soo bartay Soomaaliya ka shaqeynaay kadib Yemen Yemen waxaan ahaa taqtarada u qaabilsan arimaha haweenka oo dhan qayb dhanan ka ahaa een taqtar oo saf loogu jiro oo magaalada Manta dhan دومر هو مهم سن يا لي إيمانا يا كش قينا ما شاء الله وانكسر تجي وحن إيمت هولند هولند وحن لا إيمت شن عرورة وقفك هو تبجر وياه مركز عرورة إذا ما لحش لا يدين شيء لكن قفك هو يا هولند وقف أشي مركز ما تعلمه شن عرور ما وحن لا سوق لي حرق حوتي حرق حوتي وحاتة هاي نمبر قف مئهد أنا قو ها قف مالنتي مركان ويا راي كونتون قف لحظان قف فيس تأركاي هبين كي قلبتي أوبريشن قلاي ما قعلها دكتور مريم ملك استلقي قلها دم سدلي وحان أركاي ونمبر هاتا نمبر ملك قرن يهتا حرق وحوتي هاتا كجرتا حرق وحوتي هنا وحا كجر قومي هنا هاتو كل دوان Somali, so jek to the Tagalog di nanti. Dulu ni, ayah kena buat apa tu? Tagalog kesudah hilir as, untuk kerja kerja. Hari ini walau tu buah hari ini misa untuk lagi rasa naya. Situation kasar kusor. Nai, oh, ada buat situation. Challenging lah, dina dina anak tak kuniya jemi na ini aja. Kuburi dai. Anu ni hari mana? Yani, oh, ane kan dah lina. Masul al kahen wang wang. مركان ماشاس إمت حرضا سكوتو تيجا وان فيري وان أنالايس جري وحاي صو بحري وحاتي لجاب وين دت كماشة كجرة أو قوتو تيجا أو قوميلها كلا كديسات سو مالين يو إحكتو دت كيجا يو كوكلا وفدان وأما عرب أما دولة ذكلا روح والب ماشة اللي بعتو كجرة روح والب ما يقال وح وحم يعني وح مستقبل كيسة وح لا جسمينا يبقى أنك لا يخادنا عروت كيسة مستقبل كود ما يقال وذلك هو ذو ريرسين مركز أوكلا أوكي ده ده جرا حتى إيجا علم بدن وحاجة ده وحياة بدن إيجا في عن لكن وحدة كرتا قف كاستقرار وسوي رأيه ودوسي لي ماشى أنا محاكس عضو ماشى لكن وحلو بقى هاي هاي إن تشو استعكت هذا تشو استعكت ده تقول كشو ويقول شو قرب جوك سنة مركي وأركان ده نهود هنا ده بده وده وايس كدنا هن أنا كام كي حن بلابي إن أوبستاجو أريمها أوجرا وحن كقياسس إلى أفر بقول القيس كل لو يعني كجر نكام كا وحن أوبستاج أهلي مه دتك كام كا كجرة مركي أركان دتك كام كي أنا أريمها ودي أوبستاج نهاي مركي هرن وحن دتك أفر جري أفاف كأن كهاد الله عدك است أو كهاد الناس إن ديار وها إن أترجم أنا إلميار يار هاي استل لكن ما نقول بنا أراعي كرا، مرك عرفت ويقصوا كرا عايا لويرا وصعدا، ما دام أف عربي أنا قال وراعا، قفكي أفتلاني كهاد الكرا وحد يجر هاي ما ذا وتر جم سومالي ذي وابو سومالي ذي ذي، then وحد علي دتكي وح 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 أد إن إيه منان دتكي إن أد يوكل صنا ذا وحم بلابي عرور أنا جيران عرور هاي سنة لكن أنا كوي سام أوقف فكرة أنا أوقف فكرة 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 أوقف then in an dat kila share kare kam ka or an school journey in an an udob na wha arakna in hu raga hariri an laga bhein then in an udob na aruti wha bilawe na uha dulo or an ot unu kudo an dho aruti an shalan ma an bhaisa le anno wa le siga haya me shan kam ka wha badan wha badan na ma badan haya then wha ino bilawe hata ina ino samay yang mak budi an kaga do na ahri mahas وحان هلا فرصة دت كاس دولة كل دوانيها يعني سومالينها كجرتو كل سوني وحان كهلا 
ان ليابين تيلاتنا كلي و ان او استاغي او ان اسيري الليله هذا اذن اديك استاغي يا استاغي هي ان يدرمان ان ان مثلا حد دون كشقين هي او واحد ان كان راه انا ان انا كوذن واحد بشارع حتى كو مقاتي لكن وما صلاح حد ضدك مركا كشقين ليس وواحد ضدك يكون امن كرام مركا وحاد عظي انا جا وحا كوجر نكام كرفانا يا رب ما حلو قلت لك قلبي يا رجل تكرا لك سنه انا كوجر اي كام وحاد عظي ضدك انتو انا مسك على السوق هذا انا يا نور اذك ضدك وي جدودين وحال ارك كام مكلا او ضدك العقل سينا اي جو كرسن كرام مركا وحيد معين انتي ان لو كل وحي سمين حبين دب انت هو بقول اه وانا صباحي مظاهرات وحالي يمد بناك اللي سسوتوه وحانا وحوتي او طور بقول اه وحالا وطا كنتينر انا كنتو دلو قاد انا كميدا اه بقولتي انا كميدا انا كميدا كيجا كنتينر كيجا وطا وبرتست وسلمي اه وسلمي اه وسلمي اه انا ربنا انا شاقنا ما ربنا كنتينر كان عمتو دل انا وحكر سكرنا اي سيستم انا لو بلا ماشي وكل راقل ما ذحذي Authority Director Kilanki, while a silver hand lay good halagale, while absolutely Wahali and Dutkan or Sidana, where is Kohen and Pop and Lahan Kanaya is where we are staying, where the hand Uyera and Marian Cassin. Mila saw Bahay with your Macro Cassin, a Polandes and Mrs. Cassin, one Markima and Sorta Cappin, while Dutki and Lahan lay, Hanku and Waliera, Aniga, Maadei. أنا إذن كان إذن كم إذا هاي أنا جا مل هاد لا يضد كاس وإذن كي نرالي كأهين والله يضد كي ماشى والله كل وحالينا ااا سوماليا كل هاد لا عربيا كل هاد لا إنجليزيا كل هاد لا والله استر تامي وحي إذا وحن كور أوكي من نيجوشيت كرين كراون يربيها وحيدين ها وحن كور أنا جا إذن كان إذن كم إذا هاي مثلا حد أسوق هذا أنا جا إذن كل عقد هو مسوق هذا ناي وح أنيك إلمهي عن ربنا يعني قربا أنيك إلمهي مسون نقوشين كران كران ديل ما قلي كران ما كان ملك قلي كران وحي يقولين وقلي كتدي ومسنا ديل كستو كشو قاتنا هنا وأنا راعي دايركتر كي يقول كي أنجلي نقوشين شيء كي أقول ما دبا تدي تندت كهيسة تنكهضلي إن أنت فعلا تكرسن كرين إن أنت ميس كلاي قاتل وود قبو كامم كي نود لو إنفورميشن كأن كل هلاين أنتك إنه وان هشيني وحيد هن أوكي وان قادرنا لكن وحن ما نعيش نكست ويك بانكار سيستم إنان سمين العقل دي كوسه شو بانكيجا مال أبو حكر ستانا سمين إنا مديران ربنا إنا نو قبطان إنا أرين تان فلين وبلن بلدت كي كون نقو نجا جارسي وركاس وان سو لابتي ماشي إن سو إستاذي تتكي الله هذلي وحنقول كل ديل كاسا دين سو قاضي كوي عرب دفع عربي ينقول هذا يضد ككل انجليش بدي في فهم هاي سومالي سومالي ينقول هذا وحن كل ايدي كايدري وان نجعينا انا كوسو نيجوشيت كري راينا ماشي ان لقى دقاق روا قف انه سيسي تاجناني غوريين كل نقطه هذه الفلين واي بلانتا وقت كان وان اركينا وان تاجنا انا المهم وحن كوضع وان الفلين بلانتي او كذب هذا آه وحكي ست أو كذا وحمود الحين جينا مرك دات كأوتورتي كا إيه دات ككام وجر وحن كأجو هذا أنا إلما يرير وتقولتي أنا نمبر أنا وحبة هن نفتن نفتن آه لكن وحن أركي ليزو شبرول إن قادر كان سوقته آه دات كان قولتي كا ودات كأنا سكوب ميت كنا هنيجا أو أنا سكوب يبعت هذا قبل هذا هو ذا إكزامبل إسك وإسك بذينهن كذب مجالان دقي مجالا مركا دقي ستيل ما طريسنا كوميونيتي جيجي ماشي او قلت لي كوميونيتي جيجي وحمد الله بي انا في ري باهيدود محاكمه قد ما هي هي ستال ما حنقبن كرنا عروس ما حنقبن كرنا هول مركا كسو بوري انجليز كامي وحاين كلا دافي هول انت جوغي وحن سمي انا كوميونيتي كان وحو قبطه باهيد كوميونيتي كان حتى كورس وحن سمي او ابلونديس اي وحياب أو سير معنا هالبت كي سو بعدين بعيد ودي إلى قمن لها كذب نحن هلاي سأت كل قطي دول عن الدكتور عن هاي واحد أنا لا أقوم سنة أيضا إن هذا نسمي مجلس أن كعلي نامي خد الانيفرسيتي سهذا نلي أقوم سنة أشتغل كشقيقة هو حمسو بور إنجليزك 
ساسم او شقينا كوميونيتي كده حبيضة وحنكا وضع من سو قابنا يا بكوس شو قايلة حن رأينا انكا جوابا وحنكا وضع هدات هو يقول جيدا جوكتا ده هدا دويل اما قبر رير اوين آتا هاي هدا آتا هاي يعني ارد جامعة لكتا هدا وحابا ليدرشيب كفلا اكزامبل ايدين كسومالي اكاديميكس ايه فيل بورورد ايه وحن اتسمين ايسان وقامت الشيكة وابعنتاس وابعش حلقان كاس اتوادان مركه هو قامت وما باهنا انا ما راح نقطت وحي قب باهنتا انا قريت المسؤولية كرد بلات النقطة دات كاعد ربط انا هو قامت هدا اذن كرد بلات اتوسين قف ات هو قامت ايسان ما جرته ليدر ان فلاورس ايسان انا ما اها ليدر وحان روا انتاس انا قصو قوبا وحي كلا هدا ديه ويدين ايسان وسؤالانا ديارا هواهي اف سوماليك وحان قدور تينا وإذن كان هو سومالي أنا كان هو سومالي مرك أفق وها بون أن قوة ظهر لي كرنا أن كومن أن كومن كي كرنا كده إنه هو سومالي هذا دوما سنتين. جزاك الله خير. Thank you so much. Hi, Salam Alaikum. Um, I'm sure that we can all agree that talk was incredibly insightful. Um, one of the main things that resonated deeply with us and what I can see also on the Twitter feed is, um, it is important to share what leadership is like, especially when it's before blue ticks and material positions. Anybody can be a leader. However, demonstrating that you have, that you can, that you have a responsibility towards your community and a responsibility to do better, that is what true leadership is about. Now, the first question that we have here is, um, if I can just, apologies, just give me one second. Um, so, one of the first questions that we have here is, for instance, when it, come, when it came to in Somalia, the work that you have um, done in Somalia, from launching things such as the Panta vaccine in Somalia to spearheading the campaign to end obstetric fistula, we want to know what key skills were involved to execute these mandates, which were of such a great stature. Yes. Uh... Yeah. In English, if you can. Okay. Before going to Somalia and before joining the cabinet, as I told you, by professionally, by training, I am an obstetrician and gynecologist. And my concern, one of my worries at that time was, now there are the SDGs, everybody's speaking about SDG, but at that time it was the MDGs. The Millennium Development Goals. For me, before joining any cabinet, for me, goal five and goal, goal four and goal five, for me, it was like something that I was really worried where Somali was. But when you look at the maternal mortality ratio at that time, Somali was one of the leading countries, the highest maternal mortality. When you look at the infant mortality, neonatal under five, all those figures, we were at the bottom of the list. We have uh, the highest rates. So already it was, it was in the back of my mind even before joining any cabinet. Then when I went to Somalia in the beginning, the first cabinet in 2010, my mandate was as the minister of women and family development, but I saw the need that was there. I saw that women were dying because of something that is really preventable. I saw that the healthcare system was non-existent. When you don't have a health system in place, when in the UK or in those places that you stay, when women become pregnant, they go to the antenatal, they go to the midwife, they get uh, routine checks, they get scans, and when delivery time comes, there are the hospitals that we know about. But in Somalia, those infrastructures were non-existent, 
and, and I'm speaking about 2010, it was just when people were trying to return. I, I, I went back to Somalia to 2010 after an absence of more than 20 years. Then I saw the need was very huge. And the children, when you look at the children, the Somali children, what are the main causes of death? If you look at the by chart, number one, pneumonia. Children are dying for pneumonia. We don't have the vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine. And just even if, if, if the child gets pneumonia, if you if people have access to healthcare and bacillin, the, the child wouldn't die. The second thing, diarrhea. Children dying because of diarrhea. Missiles. Many things that you can even, like missiles, you have a vaccine for missiles. For the whooping cough, for things that we have vaccination, so many children were dying and they were the bottom. When you look at the, the annual statements about the child mortality or infant mortality under five, whatever neonatal go down, we are leading. That cabinet just, it was for a few months uh, there was a political instability. Then I came back to the UK. I changed my mind. I said, look, Marianne, you are an obstetrician and gynecologist, but my the help I can give is one-to-one. -one. Just at the time, I help one woman. That's when I understood is to serve my, communi my community in a bigger portfolio. I applied for uh, a postgraduate master's uh, to do in public health. Especially I wanted to know more about the health systems, how to build health systems, because of the Somali health systems non-existent. Uh, so I got a, a place at Warwick Medical School and I have done my public, uh, my master's of public health at Warwick Medical School. Even when, even you know, you have a mandatory modules and you have a um, selective one. Of the selective ones, I have chosen immunization and communicable disease. Why immunization? Because I have seen we need immunization. My, so many children. They are dying because of our communicable disease or something that I can prevent with vaccination. The importance of vaccination. So I was a champion for vaccination. When the chance came that I went back to Somalia and I became minister, it was a big portfolio, but it was also the minister of health was under my portfolio. Education, health it was big. Then I the first thing I was focusing on was speaking and lobbying. Because Somalia, there's no money. The government doesn't have budget. It is 2012. It is really, we are in difficult situation. It is a most fragile country. So I started to lobby, speak with donors, speak with UN agencies, do coordination. Sometimes you, you need to use your skills. You need to build. Uh, relationships. I was working with three different UN agencies, UNICEF, WHO, UNFP regarding the health. And we had different donors like Sweden, uh, UK, different donors. I cannot nominate all of them. So, so that I focused on how to get the vaccination. It was not only the benta that I wanted, I wanted even the the pneumococcal vaccine. I wanted the, rota, uh, the rotavirus uh, the, for the diarrhea, all those vaccines. But you know, the vaccinations are very expensive, but we could get at least the benta. Before the benta, if I explain a little bit about the benta. So Mali, back in the days, we had only the EPI program, which had uh, the basic, so the benta, okay, I, um, they are telling me that time is over. The benta is the BBT, the diphtheria, pertoxis, tetanus. We added two 
which were the heavy and the hip, uh, Hemophilus influenza theta. So we started the campaign. So vaccination is my dream. We cannot eradicate those diseases in Somalia without getting proper vaccination and without convincing our community and making them aware that vaccination is the best thing. Because there are a lot of myths and controversies to speak with the society, to convince them and to get the, to involve the donors, to involve UN agencies, to get jacked to vaccination. The fistula, I was a champion for fistula. I have done a fundraising even from Saudi Arabia. I have done fundraising even after the ministerial position. Fistula, it is not what I, today I cannot speak about fistula mm -hmm. because fistula in itself is a huge topic. I champion it for it, uh, but it needs in itself a topic. Also, I was, uh, after, the, after I finished the ministerial portfolio, I was uh, the Karma ambassador. The Karma is a campaign in Africa for accelerated reduction of maternal mortality in Africa. So it was also uh, lobbying, networking, speaking with different African countries. It was not easy because when you don't have enough resources, you must have a good mind. You can make friends, you can raise funds. That was how we were doing things. Okay, excellent. Um, sorry, yes, thank you. I'm just going to go over here with two screens next to each other. Sorry, I just need this for a second. So the next question that we have here is firstly, thank you very much for that um, answer and that comprehensive answer. The next question we have here is especially when it comes to utilizing your networks and, in, and, uh, and, in, and encountering different challenges. One thing that we know that you were involved in was the drafting of the um, uh, national gender policy and the gender bill and the family act, knowing that especially when it comes to the UNFPA and the UN, one of the key um, uh, um, uh, messages that they have is to reduce or basically to target um, uh, gender-based violence. Now, when it comes to these bills, can you please tell us more about the key themes that you've explored? Because what we know is women, for instance, who are living in Somalia and women that are living in the UK, they have very different needs. What themes were explored when it came to Somalia? Okay, and uh, during my tenure, we started and we drafted, but, but uh, we didn't finalize. Well, it was in 2012 when we started drafting the gender bill. When you look at the situation of women in Somalia, I don't know when, if you have the opportunity to read my article on the Guardian in, in 2000, on 11, 2000, 2011, speaking about um, women in Somalia, the worst place to be a woman is Somalia. And I was speaking about all the difficulties that a Somali woman can face, starting from GBV and making the decision to become pregnant. So uh, well, well, then before the collapse, Somali was not like this. Girls used to go to school and some women worked in the civil society sector and some women were holding positions uh, like DG, and there was a deputy minister, I think, woman. So women were there. There was a voice, and there was also this Uruka uh, Wenka. So women were, but during the collapse, the civil war, women lost everything. Due to the war, women they had to feed their children, they have to move from place to place, they have to do everything, they have to build the house. But when it comes to the round tables, when it comes to decision making, women were excluded. That is the sad news. That's what I have seen. I have seen women doing everything, selling tea in the streets, feeding the family. Then men who don't, Men who started the war, the civil war to start. Men were the ones who started the war. Men were the ones who were fighting. Okay, we want the peace building. Peace building processes, round tables, just men, no women. When you look at the, at the se public sector, not that much women you see. So that was 
when I start, and it's in the beginning, there are so many priorities. Girls don't go to school. So what are you doing? What, what do you prioritize? Girls' education was for me a priority. Because when you educate a girl, she will be the one who is coming to the round table to make the decision. But if you don't educate that girl, whatever you do, you are not giving her chance. Okay, draft the bills, do whatever, but you have to educate girls. That's why the Go to School Initiative, most more than 50% uh, the students that were enrolled were girls. So first I thought, okay, priority number one is we have to educate girls. Otherwise, from where can I bring the, uh, the one who to come to a round table to make decision? Education, education, education. That's what, what I see. The second thing was, okay, we need some kind of legal document. If you tell people, okay, FGM, it's not good, tell them. Uh, rape, rape was very high in Somalia, but you need some legal documents. Harassment, all those things were happening. So at least you have to have legal documents to pass through the parliament. So that's when I started drafting the gender bill, but uh, then I stayed, I think like 14 months, I didn't finish it. Then a minister came after me, Sarah al Samatar. She added something to it. Then now Minister Daka is doing a huge, a huge work. She's doing even uh, now the gender bill is at the parliament, she finished it. So a lot of things were being done. But what I want to tell you is, if we wanted to see change in Somalia, anybody who wants to advocate for the Somali girls and women, we have to focus on the education of girls. If girls are not educated, who is going to fight for their rights? Uh, that is, I think, um, have I answered the question? Yes, you've answered the question, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so the segment that we'll start off is the open discussion. Um, Ibrahim, if you would like to just share the topic and what points you want to discuss as my phone aside. Oh, sorry, I think I was muted. I think you may have heard me on yours. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, excellent. So no, I said thank you very much for that um, uh, for that um, uh, feedback on that question. Um, so the next part of the webinar will be the open discussion between all of our guests. And if either Ibrahim or Faisal could share the topic of that um, uh, of the open discussion, um, I don't currently have access to my phone. My battery's died. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, on behalf of Somali academics, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the guests that have joined us this afternoon um, it's been a very fruitful discussion um and you know most of us in soil academics uh, are from sort of science background so it's very interesting to have a glimpse of a complete different but important part of of society and a lot of us are growing into sort of leadership roles um, and it was important to sort of get tips and understand what is needed for us to make an impact uh, at the very top. Um, so to get things started off for the open discussion, perhaps, um, you know, one of the themes that consistently was brought up from the first, um, uh, first talk was this idea of mentorship. Um, you know, what, what is the best way of um, seeking the a, a right mentor for you? I think that's a, is an interesting one. A lot of us have supervisors that perhaps um, we might not get along with, etc. Um, so when you're seeking for a mentor, what are the sort of the key attributes and characteristics uh, that is essential? Who wants to go first on that one? Um, I'm I'm happy to come in. I just don't want to be the guy who jumps in first all the time. Um, so one of the, look at how they behave towards you when they interact. Do they treat you fundamentally like, like an equal? Um, because some people are very top down and very and regard you as you know you're too inferior and junior to me and an inconvenience. So if you find that person 
is open and passionate about engaging with you, um, then that's a very good sign. Do they treat you as an equal or do they want to give their time? Because one of the things is worth remembering is that good people who are senior want mentees. They want to pass on the information and what they learned. I mean, you heard Ruth earlier on, so passionate about what she learned and, and, and she's so keen from Anders as well. It was brilliant to hear and Mary, I mean, felt we were all speaking with the same voice. And so it's finding those people who, who speak like this and who engage with you in this way. Um, and, and then you have to be willing to put yourself forward because we're all too busy. I don't have time to run after you. What I do, but I do have time for people who put themselves in front of me and somehow or other I find the time. Um, it's amazing, a busy person can always find the time. I don't know how we do it, but it, there always seems to be a way of having the time. So find that busy person who's willing to give you a bit of time. And also think about what you have to offer. What do you bring to the table? What do you care about? You know, who are you? And you have to put that on the table uh, and, and, and look into yourself and say, what do I care about? And if you, and you, you, if you take those little lists, it will take you a long way. Yeah, this, maybe I can uh, add. <laughs> Ibrahim, is it okay if I add to what Eric was saying? Of course, go ahead on this. You know, I want to know, Eric uh, just inspired me to really share this story because uh, absolutely you have to find someone who wants to level with you, right? But it goes both ways. And I was talking about the good boss and the bad boss. And actually I had a, a job 20 years ago. I had uh, the first time I, I, I was working in the United Nations in UNOPS, the United Nations Office for Project Services. And I was called to work at the highest level with the deputy executive director. And I was very sort of respectful of him and sir and, and all of this. And, and you know, I, I was trying to be a really good employee. And he, was, he ended up being this inspiration to me, an Ethiopian man who really had the, my best interest at heart. It was funny because after a couple of months working for him as his special assistant, one day he called to me to my office. He said, Andres, why are you not leveling with me? You know, I, I need your ideas. You're young. You have ideas, but you are, you are treating me as if I'm, you know, this person who wants to be put on a pedestal. Just level with me. I'm a person just like you. And it's funny that he had to say that uh, to me to, to be sort of direct uh, and, and sort of level with him and not sort of uh, to be too respectful in a sense. I mean, of course you have to show respect, but, but he wanted me to level with him. It was, it was very interesting. But the fact that he called it out was another sign that he, he did have my best interest uh, at, at heart. And, and one of the things that I really, and I have to say this that I know that I have to follow, one of the things that I really enjoy uh, the most about working in Somalia is maybe it's sort of a nomadic culture. I don't know, someone told me that, but people are so direct. You can talk to anybody, a driver, a, a guy in the market, whatever, they will tell you their opinion and they will level with you, right? Even if you're, you are sort of a position that is sort of senior in the UN or whatever, but everyone will level and they will be genuine because when you level with people, what, it, what comes with that is that you are genuine. And being genuine is probably the most important thing uh, to be between someone who is a mentor and, and uh, a mentoree as it were, uh, that ingenuity and, and being uh, genuine. So my contribution. And could I just, could I just add, um, also just building on um, Professor Herring and, and Anders as well, um, is that from my experience uh, as an African as well, um, we are respectful. And um, when we're seeking out, out mentors, um, we just as Anders, Anders said, we can, we can be very um, 
very polite and there's nothing wrong in that there's nothing wrong in our nature um but um like he said we should also try to be direct it is a two-way relationship and just from my experience um in my in my phd journey i was based in, in a new country uh um, I was based in Scotland at the University of Glasgow. I researched my, my mentors because they were essentially my mentors. They took um, several roles in my journey over uh, a four and a half year, year period. So uh, make sure that your, your interests um, uh, both align and also that you share some of the, the same values. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, so my mentors in particular were very compassionate. They were very, uh, they were very genuine and very caring, and that helped me because they looked at me as a person. They looked at me for, for who I am, um, and so that really helps when you're trying to seek out um, a mentor. Um, can I just say uh, hi? I'm Maimon Jama. I'm head of operations for Somali Academics, and I just wanted to say I enjoyed most of your talks. They were very inspirational and the feedback online is insane so thank you very much for coming in today and um it giving us some insights into leadership um so a lot of people um i know a lot of people including me i'm interested in going back and hopefully um contributing in somalia and its society and i wanted to ask um particularly the people that um worked in somalia such as anders and eric um, how did you manage the trust, the suspicion, inter-clan, regional dynamics um, that have, how did they welcome you when you started to work there? I'm um, sorry, get the ball rolling. Um, so listen, I'm not an expert in Somalia. I, I know that I, I don't know my way around, but, I'm, but, but the point is I had a wonderful Somali student called Latif Ismail, and he introduced to me to, to many people. Uh, and, and one of the things I learned is that someone who sounds plausible and Western and speaks the Western talk uh, and speaks the language, sustainable development goals, key performance indicators, can be a nasty bad guy. And someone who speaks very little English, bear in mind that I speak no small, so, you know, I mean, I lack capacity, but someone who, who doesn't understand that language and who, who, you know, actually they could be the great person so just because they don't sound like me. And so he would, so what, what my Somali friends do is whenever I come across someone in my work, they check them out. Everyone knows everyone, right? And it's not that hard to find out what someone's track record is. So I, I, I get told, listen, this person is a good person. Listen, we've checked out, this is their track record. And, and also I am politically neutral. I am not for Somaliland, I'm not for Somalia, I'm for Somalis. I work for you guys. I will do everything I can to support you in your various enterprises. I will bring to bear the expertise I have. Uh, and I'm also not in this for the money. I don't need this. I'm a successful academic. I can walk away. So I don't need your money. I'm not after anything. And I'm not in charge. You guys are the ones who deliver the development. And so if I find I hear people who say those things, who understand that they're in charge, that I work for them, that they do, do the development, that I can't do it for you, I'm not in charge. And when, I, when it's a combination of Somali colleagues telling me who's good to work with and who isn't, and, and, and actually having those same values and objectives. And then you do a, a little bit of work together, and man, then you really find out what someone's like. You do a bit of work together, that's who they are. And so you do a little bit of activity and then you really find out. So, so um, when I work with my Somali clothes, we have a way of operating together that enables us to operate uh, successfully. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, answer. I think, uh, Maimon, you, you also asked me the same question. What, one of the things is that I think trust is a choice. At least the way I approach it is that default dealing with people, I choose for the most part to trust them by default, right? But it's important to... <laughs> Check with yourself, am I trusting this person or not? How am I, because it, it impacts 
your ability to be genuine or not genuine with the person, right? Uh, to be direct or not direct. So, so you have to sense within yourself, are you, are you trusting uh, or are you not? For the most part, as a default, I, unless betrayed, <laughs> it happens, you know, but I choose as a default, as a priori to trust each and every one that I meet. Uh, it's not always easy. Uh, and sort of check your sort of biases at the door. It's, it's not easy, but the, it's, it's something that I'm trying to do consciously. One thing that I never do in Somalia or anywhere else that I have worked, um, I don't think I've ever asked someone, certainly not early on in a conversation, which clan they're from. Because I think it's certain, it crosses a line where it's, it's not, um, all of a sudden I'm not seeing them for the person they are. Now I'm, I'm trying to put something else into the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, sometimes you can avoid and, and it comes out in a certain way, but I, it, I, it's not on my terms, it's, it's on other people's terms. And the thing is that everywhere I have worked and every, I think it's universal in all, everywhere in the world and especially for young people, Nobody wants to be labeled. Nobody wants to be labeled by, by any other person. So even sometimes you do it by, you know, um, human interest, uh, you know, uh, you ask uh, someone, let's say in the UK, who is black, where are you from? Assuming that they're not from the UK. I mean, this is a very common occurrence. We're talking about those biases. So those biases, I, I'm trying to check them at the door also in Somalia. I don't ask anybody which clan they're from. And my experience is that most young people, they don't wanna be labeled. They don't wanna be associated or entangled into this clan thing. They, they actually wanna run away from it and, 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 and sort of escape from it. Uh, so I think I owe it to them not to ask. Okay, um, I think that's all we have for open discussions. Um, we have approached the end of the first session um, and we will begin the private uh, breakout room sessions with uh, Nasr Ismail, uh, Rav Bilan and Mary Harper. Um, so if any of the existing panelists actually want to join some of the breakout rooms, then please do let us know and we'll add you into those uh, respective rooms. Um, and also if any of the attendees, if we do have spaces, then we can try and facilitate some of you guys to join these smaller breakout rooms. Um, have, is anyone from amongst the attendees got any questions, any more questions they wanna ask? Just one more perhaps, and then we can close. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So we'll uh, leave it there. Um, and then uh, we'll, those of us who are in the same sort of breakout rooms, I'll meet you inside there. Okay, good. We're doing it manually, so it might take a while for you guys to be put in the uh, breakout rooms. So just bear with us. Oh, it feels good having one laptop on my table again. <laughs> Oh, it was difficult navigating yeah. sound effects. Uh, but yeah, so it's they're now putting us into our respective um, uh, breakout rooms. Mm -hmm.